can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Robert Burko of EliteDigitalAgency.com. And Robert, before I formally introduce you, uh, I always like to point out other episodes of the podcast people should check out. And there's a couple of fan favorites in the agency world. Um, Robert, even though he looks really young, he's been doing this agency thing for a couple of decades. Um, another one, Kevin Hurrigan. Um, he had an agency, I think, back in 1995, um, and just shared how he evolved and the services and the leadership and everything in between. Also, um, Todd Tasky was an interesting one where he has a second bite podcast. He pairs agencies with private equity and actually helps sell agencies. And he calls it the second bite because he's found with his experience, some of the founders that sell make more on the second bite. Than they do on the first when it's private, you know, private equity sells again. So he talks about valuations and also the agency space. That was a really interesting one as well. And that and many more on uh, inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise 25. At Rise 25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the full strategy, accountability, and full execution around a podcast. You know, Robert, we call ourselves the magic elves that work in the background to make it look easy for the host and for the company so they can just develop relationships, they can create great content, but they could also just run their company. I kind of created the solution I wanted when I first started podcasting over uh, 15 years ago. Um, you know, for me, the number one in my thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, you can go to rise25.com and learn more. I'm excited to introduce Robert Burko. He's CEO and founder of Elite Digital. And Elite Digital is a digital marketing agency based in Toronto. Robert started Elite Digital when he was in high school over 20 years ago. He operates one of the biggest digital agencies in Canada. And Elite Digital has been one of the fastest growing companies in Canada in four different years. And they service some of the biggest global brands you've heard of, um, some of which they've worked and provided insight for popular brands like Pepsi, uh, Pepsi Canada, Rogers Communication, NBA Canada, Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment, General Mills Canada, Franklin Covey, Disney, and many, many, many more. So check them out, um, EliteDigitalAgency.com. Robert, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. So just talk for a second about elite digital agency and what you do, because you're kind of the magic elves on a lot of different levels and a lot of different services. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what's really fun is so elite digital is a full service end to end digital agency. So really, we do it all uh, soup to nuts, strategy, execution, reporting, analytics. Um, so if you see it on a screen, I generally say that we do it. Uh, but we're really focused on sort of maximizing results. And really one of the things that makes us special is everything is under one roof. So one of the things I found a lot over the years is businesses and brands were having 10 different agencies doing 10 different things. And just, it's not cohesive. You get a lot of finger pointing. People are wondering why this part of their marketing doesn't connect to that part of their marketing. And we're sort of the glue that brings it all together because it's all under one roof. So when clients come to us, and they say, here is my challenge, here is my problem, here are my goals, here are my pain points, here's what I'm lying awake at night nervous about. We say, great, point us to your goals and we're gonna figure out how to get there. And then we start with strategy. So we have an excellent strategy team that understands your business, the landscape, the competitors. Everything starts with a winning strategy because I firmly believe if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So we create this winning strategy. And then because at Elite, we have our own creative department and our own development team. And we have a digital marketing team that does social media and SEO and paid media and programmatic and everything else. We have data scientists that dig into the data. We have amazing project managers and client services people. So when you wrap all that together, we're able to strategize. We're able to think about all the different channels you should action on because if you call an agency that only does search marketing, guess what? Every answer to every problem you have is going to be search marketing. And we don't believe that's the case. So we really are able to dive into our eclectic 
uh, skills and talents and then figure out, here's what you need. Here's how we're going to optimize it. We execute it uh, to perfection. It's awesome. Uh, we have great, amazing people. We have an awesome culture. So I like to say we have fun along the way. And then we measure everything. I'm a big data geek. We measure everything. So we make sure that from that first conversation of here's my goals, we make sure that when we say, great, we're going to get you there, we fulfill on that promise and get you to those goals. Uh, and then our clients are really happy. We're really happy. And that really breeds uh, long-term relationships that we're incredibly proud of, which is why I'd like to say uh, after 20 years, we're, we're still here doing it and rocking and rolling. Uh, I think we're doing something right. So if someone's listening to this, there is a video portion and we're looking here at EliteDigitalAgency.com and you can see that. Now, you know, Robert, I want to go back to your roots for a second, because it wasn't always like that. Actually, when you first started, I remember um, listening to you talk about how you were doing everything at that time. And you realized this is too much. This is too much for my what I'm doing now. I can't offer all these things. And you actually at the time decided to focus on one thing when you started. And that one thing was email. So talk about the decision at that time, just to focus, because you could today still could be like, listen, we're, you know, just doing email, right? Um, you actually even had a software and a cloud-based software at that time was very unique, um, right? With elite email. Like, so why did you choose email at that time and your decision to just focus on one thing? Yeah, so it's super funny because I always sort of joked that I've come full circle and the, the realizations young Rob had many moons ago, uh, it's kind of funny to reflect on it now. So long ago, so I started this company when I was in high school. So goofy teenage Rob in his parents' basement uh, started this company and, you know, young version of me, the things I would tell myself now, but basically I was like, oh, we're going to do everything. And I, my first, you know, when we launched, you know, you know, 20 years ago, I was like, okay, we're going to have this service and this service and this service. And I didn't have any outside funding. It was basically me sitting in the basement, um, trying to do everything. And I just noticed I was being spread too thin. Um, and essentially it was, if you're the jack of all trades, you're the master of none. And what I realized early on was I'm just spread too thin that I might be average at a, bun a bunch of things, but I'm not really best in class at anything. And that's when I had to make my big bet, which is when I bet on email. Now, go back in time. You know, now we all get a million newsletters every single day. Go back in time, 15, 20 years, email marketing was still sort of new, right? Companies weren't doing that. So at the time, I was like, this is going to be the future. I bet big on email marketing. I abandoned some of the other things I was doing. And I said, we are going to be the best at email marketing. I created one of the first cloud-based email marketing softwares in Canada with Elite Email. Um, and we did that. And it was successful. It was really good. But an interesting thing happened. We became the best at email marketing. And then clients would call us and say, you know, Rob, team, I love what you're doing uh, with my email. Can you also build my website? And we said, no, 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 no. We could only, we only do email. And they say, Rob, I love what you're doing. Can you help me with social media? And I would say, no, 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 we only do email. And then one day I sort of woke up and I said, wait a second, here I am. I have all these talented people because the people at Elite are always our secret sauce. We have the best people. I'm the luckiest guy in the world to work with such awesome talent and amazing people. But I was like, I have all these amazing people. Why am I saying no to all these things? What if we try saying yes? And that was sort of the moment everything flipped and we kind of grew into a bigger agency, but we did so with a focus on the learning that I had, which is we can't be average. We have to be amazing. We have to be best in class because these clients, small brands, big brands, they're not going to come to me if we're just as good as the others or inferior. We have to be better. We are going to be the better option. So we started saying yes to everything, but when doing so, we said yes with the goal of being the best. So yes, I will do your email and I will build your website, but I'm not going to build a good website. I'm going to build a great website and we're going to be the best at it. And we made sure of it. And then someone would say, can you do my social media? Yes, but we're not going to be good. We're going to be great. We're going to be best in class. So what happened was we kept saying yes with the goal of being best in class. But when you say yes over and over and over again, and there were times my team would be like, oh my God, Rob. Please don't say yes to another thing. Like, let us catch our breath, please. And I'd be like, no, yes, we could do it. Um, leading to many funny stories. But over time with that sort of idea of, yes, we could do it. But if we're going to do it, we're going all in and we're going to be number one and no one's going to do it better. That kind of set us on this path where now when you jump forward almost two decades, I'm back to doing all these things. But we've scaled in a way where as we added each one, we never accepted anything less than being best in class. 
And it just so happens all these years later, we've been very fortunate with our success that now we do it all again. But across all these services, I could tell you we are best in class at everything and our clients get to experience that as well. And they kind of like having one team that could just do it all at top tier. I'm curious, you know, um, Robert, well, what point do you say yes, right? Did you, you know, in the beginning, obviously it was a smaller team, so you didn't want to spread too thin. At what point did you decide, okay, we'll release this next service? Did you have someone there with a specialty? Did you then go, you know what? We're going to just find the specialty. And I don't know if there was like a methodical way that you you did this, but um, if you're like, yo, we're just going to do add this service and then we'll add this service. Or you're like, you just kept saying yes and kept piling people on. How did, how did you decide? Um, what was your methodology? So I would like to say there's a method of the madness. Some people on my team back then might say otherwise, but I like to think there was a method of the madness. So I think it was really about strategizing how can we get to be the best at it, right? So that might have meant, you know, I had to learn something new. We need to we need to expand the skills we had. We're big on learning and education and growth at Elite Digital. So, you know, can we upskill our current staff? Do we have to go in and get someone new? But I think the sort of thinking was, there's obviously a need for this. Our clients are asking for it. Are other clients going to ask for it, right? If one person says, can you do, you know, ABC, we don't want to do something super niche for only one person, but basically it was, okay, they're asking for it. Do we think there's an opportunity here where our other clients can benefit, where future clients can benefit? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Now, how do we get there? What do we need? And then it was basically figuring out how do we find the staff to do it? How do we train ourselves to do it? But then also a lot of research. What's out there in the market right now? Because in order to be better than everybody else, we had to understand what everybody else was doing. So we would look into the industry, look into the service line. Oh, they're doing it this way. And I think there's a better way to do this. And then we'd sort of figure out the game plan of, okay, if we're going to say yes, we only say yes if we could win. And then here's sort of our path to victory. Here's the ingredients we need. And don't get me wrong, we stumbled. I would never tell you otherwise. I think as an entrepreneur, I've learned a lot more from my failures than my wins. So I don't want to make it seem like it was easy. It was not. Um, but I think we were very methodical in, you know, go big or go home. And how do we line it up to make sure we can get there? And I'm not saying we we're the best overnight. But once we sort of figured out, yes, we're going to go find great people. And yes, we already have great people. And everybody at Elite was so determined, it kind of put us on a path where we said yes, but we said yes with confidence, knowing where we'd land. And if we couldn't land there, if we thought we could not be the best, then we simply wouldn't do it. Because again, we just focus our efforts on something we could win at. I could see it's really interesting, Robert, because I could see if I go back a couple different paths that you could have taken. Right. You could have just focused on email and SMS. At the time, you were even doing SMS, which is yeah. not, uh, which was pretty early on. Um, and the other thing you could have done is you could have just gone all in on the software front because you had a cloud based software. So I'm, I'm curious software versus agency. Like you could have been MailChimp, right? That sold yeah. for, that started as an agency that created MailChimp and sold for a billion dollars. And maybe you'll still do that, but but not on the software front. Why did you decide? And maybe that you were just, why did you go agency versus software and not all in on the software part? No, great question. And, and listen, in an alternate universe, maybe I took a different path and maybe that was the right one. I have no idea. And I guess we'll never know. Um, so it's an interesting thing. So I fundamentally, I think I had more fun on the agency side. Um, I mean, I think opportunities presented themselves, which helped, but I think it was fundamentally more fun because we were building software, but the days were pretty similar, right? We provided software, we sold the software, we supported the software, and I'm fueled by a good challenge, right? I love that. So the fact that we sort of have these clients and when we turned into an agency, it was, here's a CPG client, here's their challenge, what are we going to do? Here's a pharma company, here's their challenge, what are we going to do? Here's a small business, here's an e-commerce company. So it kind of became a little bit more exciting to have all these different clients where instead of just trying to sell software, and don't get me wrong, I respect the people selling software and I like recurring revenue of software and all that's great. But I think that desire to just have a little bit more excitement, agency life is great. You know, I, lo I always loved that. And I think when we sort of saw, hey, we could have a lot more fun because now I could be in 10 different industries helping 10 different clients on any single day. And the same goes for my whole team as opposed to that's our technical support department that deals with the same software every day. 
So I think a mix of sort of opportunity and then also what just generally seemed more exciting at the time. And especially if you can remember, I was a digital agency like years and years and years ago. So at the time when I started doing this, there weren't that many other digital agencies. And a lot of the traditional agencies out there actually became my partners because they were like, our clients are starting to ask for this and we don't do this. And I would call them up and say, hey, all those things you can't do, I can do it. I have amazing people here. Why don't you tell your client you can do it? You work with us. We'll make it happen. And that kind of created this entire partner model that we have. So we're the partner to a lot of traditional agencies, which really was bred out of that era because their clients demanded it. They didn't want to do it internally. I said, great, that's all the stuff we're really good at. So the client was happy. The other agency was happy. We were happy. And then it was really nice too, because I was getting calls from agency partners being like, hey, you know, we now have this client go. And I was like, oh, I don't have to do any business development here because every new client you get becomes a client for us. And, you know, we re that really let us focus on doing the best work as well. So in our earlier years, instead of having to worry about business development, getting new clients, we really honed our craft on let's be the best at these deliverables while our agency partners are out there doing sort of RFPs. And that also kind of let us be a little bit more special. So the clients, it sounds like we're, we're coming in and it just kind of naturally you just follow that as opposed to trying to, I mean, when a lot of agents they talk to, you know, the, sometimes the software is just like, oh my God, I want to have the software recurring revenue. You're smiling because you know what I'm talking about. And you kind of, not the opposite route, but you're like, you had a software actually. And, but you had this traction, it sounded like with partners. Talk about the, the partner model for a second, because, you know, some of the companies I've had on, the fastest growth they've had is because they have partnerships. Yeah, so I Talk think partners, partner I, mean, I, think, I think we're where we are now be, because of that. And, and into this day, our partnership model, like we have other agencies literally around the globe and I mean, mostly in North America, where we are the digital arm of that agency. And sometimes it's white label, we're invisible. We do work for all these clients that is awesome and we can't talk about it and they don't even know it's us. And other times we have agency partners where we stand beside them and hey, this is our digital partner. I think it was really great because it was win-win. And I love, I mean, I'm a people person, I'm all about relationships and it really lent itself to, this is going to be a win-win engagement because these other agencies, they had a need, but the thought of, hey, should we go hire a bunch of, developers and SEO experts and email experts and social media experts, like basically they're thinking, should we go hire 25 new people to build this department? And they were like, no, we don't want to do that because we don't know if we're going to have sustainable work. We don't know, you know, we don't want that on our payroll, but they still had to do it. They had the need. So when I was like, hey, you have this pain point, your client has these needs, we could be the answer. And by the way, the thing that makes Elite Digital special is the fact that our work is amazing the stars sort of aligned. And then I thought it was great. The Their agency thought it was great. And these were all different agencies. So our agency partners are traditional marketing agencies, brand agencies, PR agencies, print agencies. Like it was just such an amazing mix of all these agencies that had all these clients that suddenly wanted websites and they needed SEO and paid media and search marketing that when I was like, oh, by the way, agency partner, here's the list of services you can offer tomorrow with confidence that it's being done incredibly well, they were like, let's go. I remember, I mean, there was a time many years ago when I used to have business cards from so many different agencies that were pretending I was their employee because I was hopping on calls being like, who do I work for today? Oh, agency, you know, Acme agency. Okay, no problem. And then I'm going to that call being like, yeah, digital marketing, no problem. What are your goals? What do you need? And then everyone was happy. It was just a great vibe and everyone was having fun and the work was good. And Basically, with everyone being all smiles, it was just a really great synergy. So it's, that's what I was going to ask is the best agency partners for you, which it sounds like because you you offer so many services, but the traditional print, traditional agencies, PR agencies are good partners because they're not doing all the services that you do on the digital front. Yeah. So, I mean, we're really good, right? So we value our partnership. So if we do something and our partner does it, we're not going to do it with that partner. And we respect that. And we have good boundaries and, you know, good fences make good neighbors. We know that, right? Like we are tight with our partners. We have partners we've been with for, for well over a decade. So if they offer it and we offer it, guess what? It's not in our repertoire for them because they're going to do it. We respect it. No problem. But basically it's like, hey, agency partner, whether you're a traditional marketing agency or anything else, here's 
30 things we could do for you. Cross off the ones that you're not interested in. Cool, we'll pretend they don't exist. And everything else, you can now offer this to your clients. And a lot of times we're pairing something we offer with something they offer. So maybe they're doing one piece and we're taking it and running with it. No problem. We're the easiest people on the block. So it's always what works best for them, what works best for the client. And because we're just so easy and flexible, we're not like, oh, we have to do it all or we're not interested. We're basically coming to the table saying, how can we be the best partner for you so that your clients are happy? They love the digital marketing they're getting. They feel they're getting great results. You feel like you have a partner you can trust. We're not taking anything away from you. All we're doing is adding to the mix. And then they're like, great. So we never compete with our partners because we don't want to, because that's our entire business model is we all have to work together and win together. So we basically work hand in hand with them. What do you need? They say, this is what success looks like. And then we make it happen. I know a lot of, um, I've talked to a lot of people about this and and some people struggle with this, Robert, about um, their partner program. And they think about how do I, what should be the compensation structure? You know, um, should they company market up? Should there be a percentage? How do you recommend a company thinking about the compensation structure to that white label or quasi white label partner? So I would recommend there is no one answer. Uh, I mean, that's the honest answer. I, and I've been down it. I mean, I've spoken to so many agency partners literally in every corner of the world. And the one thing I've learned is there is no answer to that because it's a question we often ask. So basically the way we approach it is with each agency partner, we talk about their business model and what's going to work best for them. So we have some agencies where we say, here's our rate card. Feel free to mark it up. Go wild. No problem. This is really easy. We have you know other agencies where it's, here's what we're going to charge and here's your percentage back. Fundamentally, for us, it honestly ends up being the same. It's just the way we package it. And some of them want that rate card markup. Some of them want just a percentage kickback. Some of them want to sort of, here's the flat rate for the project. Go, we'll charge whatever we want. Um, so because we sort of go to them and say, let's not talk about what's going to work best for us, but like us individually, but what's going to work best long-term for this team? Because at the end of the day, I don't want sort of one-off relationships. I'm not looking for a new partner because we have one single project. I'm looking for a partner where now we're going to grow old together, right? Now we're going to work together for the long haul. Now our teams are going to blend together. We have agency partners that we work with where there's probably new staff on their team that they don't know if my staff are part of my company or their company. So because it's sort of like a, what's going to work best, I think that's honestly the answer I would give people. And if you're trying to find one single way, then you're going to find it only applies to a certain subset of people because it just it can't be one size fits all. There's just too many moving parts. I'd love to go in the weeds a little bit, Robert, about email, because uh, I know you geek out on email and SMS, okay? Um, so, because you've seen really the evolution of email and SMS from early days, what should companies be thinking about now? Maybe we'll start with SMS um, in the SMS universe. So if we're going to start with SMS, I think the difference now is uh, everybody uses SMS right? I mean, the joke of it is like, what's the least used, the least used app on your phone? It might in fact be the phone app. And there's an irony to that, right? Like I get a bunch of messages where if my phone suddenly rings right now and it's not a text message, I'm like, "Uh oh, something's wrong. Like, why am I getting a phone call? Right? So we now sort of live in this world and it wasn't always like that where everybody's communicating by text, right? I get so many more text messages. Even now I'm talking to you, I can see my phone dinging with text messages and I'm fighting the urge not to look but we all communicate by text messages that didn't used to happen. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. So I remember when that was new. I mean, there was a time when you were paying per message that you sent. Now it's all unlimited. Everybody, obviously. I remember one of my friends would yell at me when I'd send him a text message because it was charging him 10 cents a text. He's like, absolutely. I mean, I get my bill at the end of the month. <laughs> for sure. So, I mean, that was a different world. So I think what's happened now is the way we, as, as a sort of a society, communicate is different. And then how do brands involve themselves in that? right? So me texting you is one thing, but me getting a text message from a a brand that I follow is different because text messages are a little bit more intimate, a little more personal. So I've seen a lot more brands adopted as another channel as part of their sort of multi-channel communication strategy. I think there's a cadence to it that is lower. So, you know, brands and businesses that send out a daily newsletter, you can't send out daily text messages. Everyone's going to be like, whoa, not enough. But if you really sort of pick your moments to be like, I have something worth saying, and I want everybody to look at it, 
and you could put it in a short, succinct text message, it's actually really, really effective because I don't know about you, but if I see a little one indicator on my messages app, I am compelled to look at that. Whereas I probably don't look at every single email I get all day long. Totally. Um, what about email? Best practice. So, yeah. So email has been a super interesting evolution because I've been doing it. I mean, I started when like there was no graphics in email, right? It was only plain text, which is going to date me. But either way, I started so long ago. So what's been neat to see is the evolution away from the what I call spray and pray approach, um, which is almost like we're going to send a monthly newsletter on the first of the month to every subscriber we have. And we're going to pretend that every subscriber is the same and they all want the same content. And here's what everybody gets. And that's really the, I mean, people still do that, but that's really the old way of thinking about it. So now when we approach a client, we're looking at their database going, okay, here's all your subscribers. Great. Are every one of these people exactly identical because you have them in one big group? And they're like, no, not everybody's the same. We're like, great. So now we do a lot of segmentation. How can we slice and dice this database? What do you know about these customers? Either because they gave you the information or we'll look at past behavior analytics to say, we're going to take you from one group called all subscribers to 20 groups that are so highly refined. And then once we have that, it really boils down to right message, right person, right time, right place. So now that we have the segmentation, it's not we're sending out one newsletter to everybody. It's you're getting something that's going to be more personalized to you that resonates with you. And then we also do a lot of marketing automation. So instead of it being on the first of the month, you're going to get our newsletter, which we still do. Now it's going to be, oh, you signed up for more information on our website. We've created a lead nurturing funnel where you're going to get an email right away the next day, three days later, five days later. And it's almost like we're taking each person by the hand and scripting out these communication touch points which to that person is highly effective. And in our strategic thinking, it's we're really taking you on this journey to mobilize you towards our ultimate end goal without you saying, wait till the first of the month to get our newsletter. So we've seen a lot of savviness and marketing automation and customized journeys and segmentation and personalized content. And we see that across the web. The email that I get from Amazon is a different email than you get from Amazon because Amazon knows what we're looking at. And we sort of take that principle and apply it to every business and what we're seeing is the ROI of the email marketing efforts is so much higher because, oh, I sent you an email that's relevant to you. So you click on it, you perform the action, add to cart, buy now, whatever it is, as opposed to why are they sending me this? I This has nothing to do with me, right? I'm I'm not going to buy this product. So we don't want to waste that. There's a great example, um, a sports retailer that we work with. They didn't really track, you know, which sports teams people were interested in. So no one's going to buy a jersey from the team they hate the most, and they're definitely going to buy the jersey of the team they like the most. So once we started doing behavior and analysis and figured out, oh, you are most likely to buy, you know, this team. Oh, you're a Green Bay Packers fan? Okay, guess what? You're going to get emails about the Green Bay Packers. And once we started doing that, the revenue just really skyrocketed. Yeah, so you advise first, you're looking at segmentation. One, don't treat everyone equal. And then you're building out these specific email campaigns for each of those segments. Absolutely. It's about personalized content these days. Gone are the days of treat everyone like they're the same and have the same interest and motivating factors. These days, hyper-targeted marketing, that's the future. That's where we're going. That's what we focus on. It's why we do A-B testing with everything we do and multivariant testing. We're trying to figure out how to maximize everybody's marketing budget. And that's not just, oh, Rob has an idea and this will maximize the budget. It's literally systematically breaking apart the audience, understanding their motivating factors, and then sending the right message, not just email, but every channel that's going to mobilize them to your towards your goal. So Robert, now like we are talking about as you start with email and you add services, you add team, and you've grown to a larger team, I'd love to hear some of the key hires. Um, you know, the, the evolution, some of the key hires that took you to the next stages of your agency. Absolutely. So we're a people powered organization. The one thing I'll say about Elite Digital is we are people powered. Someone wants to know what the secret sauce is of our organization. It's our people bar none. I'm the luckiest guy in the world to work with such awesome and amazing people. That's the most important thing. And our culture is really awesome. I'm incredibly proud of that. I grew up sort of going to different camps and I like to believe I sort of infuse that in what we do. Um, and we do all sorts of fun things at Elite uh, to make really have an amazing culture. And that lets us attract the best people. Yeah. And, and that to me is one of the most important things. So the key hires for me are really going to be sort of my leaders and our leadership team. 
Um, I have a problem where I like holding everything and being in control. And as I grew as a leader, being able to delegate and trust other people to do the work uh, was a real challenge for me. And I'm the first one to admit that. But when I look at sort of the leadership team we have now and the people we have on our roster, it is a group of amazingly talented people that I trust completely, top to bottom, and they are gifted in their craft. So if I was doing it before and I thought I was doing a good job, holy smokes, did they take it to a whole new level? And because they're on a higher level, right, whether it be the best at marketing or creative or development or client services, whatever it is, because I try to find people who really have that elite spark who, who are going to be motivated not to do a good job, but to do a great job, coming back to sort of our core, core values. Um, I've been able to find these amazing people, and then they're able to inspire their teams to be better. You know, I always say Michael Jordan was amazingly talented, but when he stepped on the court, all the players around him got better. And that's what I look for in my leaders. When they step on the court, all the people that are around them get better. And I've watched it happen year after year. And that's really our secret sauce, having the right people. And then when you have the right people at the leadership team level, and they're bringing the best out of their team, and the people on their team also are loving the culture of elite, they feel a connection to the agency, they want really to excel, we never accept the status quo. When you have this entire stack of people who are always pushing to be better, you know, my catchphrase around the office is be better tomorrow than you were yesterday, because I always want to be improving. When you have that in the organization, top to bottom, magical and amazing things happen. So talk about you're in high school, right? Yeah. You're in your parents' basement. What yeah. was your first key hire? Uh, my first key hire, gosh, oh man, my memory's not that good anymore. I think my first key hire at that point was getting into creative. Um, so what I rapidly found was um, visuals really help sell in the next client. So once we started hiring really talented and amazing creative people, that propelled us forward because in our portfolio, in our case studies, instead of being like, look how good our programming is, you know, look how well that button works, or even to say results, look how much this media campaign did when we had these beautiful, sexy graphics for these brands. And it was just really breathtaking. The visual stimulation was like other brands saying, oh, I, I want that. And I haven't seen a website that looks that good. And I haven't seen banner ads that look that good or an email that looks that good. So I think jumping into the creative aspect really helped propel us forward because not only were we sort of doing the digital side, but then all of a sudden we paired digital with award-winning creative. And that really propelled us forward into our growth trajectory. So it was starting to hire these um, team members that were specializing in creative. Um, what about from a management perspective where you started to kind of step away and, you know, be able to work um, on the business instead of doing everything in the business? What were some of those uh, people or positions that you had to hire for to start to step out? Yeah, absolutely. So I saw a moment ago on your screen, you had your cursor over uh, uh, Lindsay Cohen, who's a fantastic example, an amazingly talented lady, uh, truly gifted in so many ways. I mean, that was an incredible hire for me because it wasn't that, oh, she was going to creative or development or anything else, but she really understood the vision of what we were trying to do, her determination not to be an agency like everyone else, but to build an agency that she was proud of, um, that was her own, that she knew was truly best in class, where she was able to take everything she had learned throughout her career. And now instead of sort of being part of the machine, help build the machine, that was a really special thing because then suddenly I had a partner beside me uh, who could help drive things forward. That's really what expanded us into our health marketing division because she was an expert. She understood what we were doing. She was living and breathing the culture. And then I was able to say, great, you go manage that side of the company and I'm going to go manage this side of the company. And then suddenly everything got a whole lot better because instead of things being spread so thin, I was able to really focus. It's no different. Uh, Justin Olch is up on your screen right now. He handles a lot of our finance and everything else. If I'm busy looking at all of our finances and everything else, I can't do what I'm doing. So as we grew, we found all these amazing people who really complemented what I could do. And it became not, oh, you do what I do, but rather I could do this and you could do that. And it's the same strategy I use with everybody else. You know, we joke around the office because when I started the company, I didn't have creative. So I know Photoshop and I know all these programs. Now there's a joke at the office that I better not open Photoshop because if I do it, it is not at the level we want. But when I found all these people who sort of 
were best in class at what they did and complemented my skills while having that same just sort of philosophy, values, and goals, it just took us to a whole new level. And now I have this leadership team that is just awesome and amazing. And it's so inspiring to watch because we're really our best in class at what we do. Robert, people have taken different routes for that, right? So let's talk about Lindsay for a second. Some people would um, <clears throat> bring someone and they start at one position and they kind of you know, progress up to that level. And some people hire someone from the outside for that position. Did yeah, Lindsay so start in the company move up or did she come in from, you know, and, and come in as a managing director? So Lindsay came in as the managing director uh, and I was very fortunate. It really felt like the stars just aligned uh, in a really, really special way. Um, she was the person we were looking for. I just did not know her name was Lindsay Cohen at the time we started looking. Um, and then once I met her, I was like, you're the one we're looking for. Like, where were you hiding? Why weren't you here before? Because that would have been better. But boy, oh boy, am I glad you're here now. And it was really great. I mean, you know, I'll tell you, I knew right away uh, it's what I was looking for. And I knew what right away- What were you looking for? The... Um, I was looking for someone who was not willing to accept the status quo and wanted to push for greatness. Um, I think it's easy to be complacent. And I really wanted someone who was willing to sort of push us to be better than we were. Um, I was looking for someone who would understand that it wasn't my agency, it was our agency. And I think I was really looking for someone who had the same values as me as well. Our culture was so important. So when I met someone like Lindsay, and again, she also came up through camp and stuff like that, it was like, wait a second, we think the same way, but you have all these complementary skills. And even to, the, to this day, I mean, even yesterday I was talking to her and I said, it's the most amazing thing because many times we're totally aligned and we agree completely. And then other times we disagree, but it creates this amazing balance where at this point in time, I actually need her to balance me out because I'm afraid if I don't have her to balance me out, I'm going to go way off in this direction and I need someone to rein me in. So it just creates this amazing balance where we're able to work together and achieve so many great things. Meanwhile, she's keeping me honest and we're just having fun along the way. And I think across my entire leadership team, that's what we have. It's this great balance. And I love when I disagree with my leaders because that's how we get to a better result. And I think we have a culture that welcomes that. We welcome disagreement, right? Um, we have a new person who joined our organization, Violet, um, and she's helping to transform it even further. And she's bringing a wealth of experience and her entire career, she's been doing amazing things. And I remember when she joined, I said, here's a lump of clay. What do you want to do with it? Um, and I was excited about that. And she was excited about that because being able to sort of forge our own path and figure out what we want to do and take all the things we've learned and say, I don't like when organizations do this, so we're not going to do it. And I love when they do that, so we're going to do it. Because everyone on our team is empowered to sort of drive that forward, and I encourage it, it's very exciting to see both how far we've come and also where we're going to go next. What's an example you can think of where there was a disagreement and then what happened, where, where she had to rein you in or kept you on oh, happens, you, I mean, she'll you tell you what happens so. uh you mean in the last five minutes like wow we're chatting. i mean who knows it happens all the time um i think there's just i mean i don't think it's about being right or wrong i think in the world that we live in it's shades of gray right so a lot of if the decision is obvious we're usually aligned right away i think when it comes to staffing decisions what do we need to do the direction of the company where do we want to invest what do we want to do where do we want to spend our money who do we want to hire i, I think it's not so much about a disagreement but rather, you know, I'm right, or I think I'm right, she's right, or whoever he's right, whoever I'm talking to, we're all right, no one's wrong. And yet at the same time, we have to talk through it. I often say it's not about a disagreement, we just each want to sort of lay all the cards on the table, and then basically poke holes in the other idea, not because we're attacking them or defending our idea. But by poking holes in it, we're able to find the best solution. And I think oftentimes, even in my younger years, I make a decision and I didn't look at every angle and I missed something. And I only realized I missed it once I made the decision and it was too late. And now with my whole leadership team, we have a great approach where it's, we're going to make a decision. Let's attack it heads on. Let's poke holes in it. Let's make sure we've thought of everything. It's just leading to a better idea where what I often find is the decision that gets made, it actually doesn't end up being anyone's idea they had initially. It ends up being everybody's ideas put in a blender. And now it's a much better idea we're moving forward with. Yeah. So maybe a budget thing, it may be a spending thing, it may be a staffing thing, but thinking, bring it to the leadership team to think through all the angles and what are the priorities and kind of, 
uh, not duke it out, but like people have certain opinions, all right, on what the priorities are, I imagine. Absolutely. And I want everybody to have an opinion, right? And I would say, I think one of the things that makes Elite Digital special is it's not only done at the leadership team level. One of the things I love about our culture is everybody has a voice. One of the most amazingly special things about Elite is we have our senior people coming up with ideas, but we also have, let's say, our most junior person coming up with ideas. And because we create this forum where we literally welcome that, and I always say ideas breed ideas, but because we have this culture of, hey, everybody in the organization, how could we be better tomorrow than we were yesterday? Bring that to the table. And it doesn't mean we're going to do it. We can't do every single idea, but we have an environment where it's safe and welcoming to bring that forward. And even to this day, we'll have junior staff say, why are we doing it this way? This makes no sense. And I'm like, you're right. It makes no sense. But from where I said, I wasn't even going to see that. So thank you so much for calling it out. And the fact that we have the whole organization pushing to improve, I think is the reason why we sort of never accept the status quo and are always pushing for greatness, because that's just the mindset of everybody in the organization is how could we be better? And I think that's really special because it's not only at the top, only at the bottom, it's literally everywhere. Is there, you mentioned a forum for it. Is there some process or system within or structure within meetings or um, that will allow people to voice what they're thinking because they may have come from another company that that was not the culture, right? And so it has to be somehow embedded or taught or, you know, because they may, people may have been like, in my other company, I'm not supposed to speak up. I'm just supposed to do this. How is it embedded in some of the process or meetings? So yeah, so, and do it that. does, it does happen because I, so every new employee who starts at Elite, I call them and I spend time with them. No matter who they are, no matter what their role is, every single new person, one-on-one -on -one time with me gets booked because I want to welcome them to our elite family, and that's important. And in that meeting, I tell all of them, and you can ask any employee at Elite, I tell all of them, where you came from, they may have said, put your head down and do your job. And that is not what we do here. Okay, yes, we want you to get your work done, but here, everybody has a voice. And I don't think it's so much a formal process of the last five minutes of every meeting is free forum, go wild and crazy. I think it's a cultural thing. I think we've empowered everybody to understand they have a voice, which is why I call it out right away. Because when everybody feels comfortable and every idea is welcome, and I always say ideas breed ideas, when everyone just feels that, it just flows organically. So we've actually found we don't need a formal process because you know I always say I have an open door policy. I get junior staff messaging me on Slack saying, hey, I have an idea. And that's welcome here. I'm the CEO, they're the most junior employee, and it's totally okay for them to share their ideas with me. And I love it. And I welcome that. And I encourage that. And all my leaders encourage that. So because we have this culture of please share your thoughts and ideas, and again, criticize our idea. We put out constant surveys. What do you think? How can we make it better? We're always doing that. I think that's super important. And then it's how we get fresh new ideas. Um, recently, Michelle joined us as our new uh, as senior marketing person, our leadership team, tons of new ideas, new processes, new way of doing things. She's reshaped the entire department in amazingly amazing ways that it's so easy to see how much better we've gotten. And I know she's always encouraging her team. What can we do to be better? How can we improve? How can we be more efficient? So it literally is this cascading effect of aligning everybody to please be open and share. And this is a safe space. And we hear all the time that that's special about elite that you don't get in other places. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like, I mean, they're the, one of the biggest processes you get on the phone with them and you basically um, tell that to them and, and make sure they know it. And, and so I love to talk about some of the things you do culture. You mentioned you do different things to help a foster that culture. Um, what are we looking at here on the page? So we're looking at elite, <laughs> elite uh, digital agency.com slash about us. What are we, what are we seeing here? Yeah, absolutely. So we do this thing. Uh, it's called the Elite House Cup. Um, so again, I came up through 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 camp. So basically, we have this Elite House Cup where we divide everybody onto different teams, um, and not by department because I like mixing it up, right? So it's not oh, creatives are here, devs are here. I want to mix it up because I also want to make sure everybody is friends with everybody else uh, on the team. So we do this thing called Elite House Cup where everybody has their different teams, and then periodically we'll do these different activities. Uh, competitions. So this was one where um, we actually took this from a big brother competition where you basically had to spell the longest word and it was timed. So we had people running back and forth. And these are actually like kindergarten uh, cards of different letters, but it was a bunch of people running back and forth, trying to find different letters to spell the word. We've done the egg drop challenge. We've done water balloon toss. 
we've done, you know, uh, flip cup competitions. We do all these different games, which is just lots of fun. And not only is it fun, but there's often a learning objective and, a, you know, an objective like, oh, we're fostering teamwork or we're working our communication skills. So not only are we having fun together and building stronger relationships, but we're also becoming better at what we do because you actually, whether you realize it or not, you walk away with sort of a skill of, hey, I now know how to work with this person and now I'm going to be better equipped to work with them, not when we're trying to spell the longest word, but when we're trying to build a website for a client. So I often see how transferable it is, but it's also a lot of fun. Love it. I want to talk about gamification and some of the stuff that you do with your clients. So Again, if you're looking at the uh, the video, you could, or if you're listening to the audio, um, we're looking at EliteDigitalAgency.com, the work page. We could see here Movember, Movember PepsiCo, Doritos, Cheetos, Ruffles, Budweiser. Um, and there was, um, this was an interesting one that, that stuck out to me, Cialis. Okay, Cialis. And there's a, we're looking at a, a picture here of a goalie. Um, talk about this one. Yeah, so... One of the things that sort of been interesting to watch as I've watched digital evolve is it kind of became talking at your consumer to talking with your consumer, right? So the reason gamification is growing a lot and we see this everywhere is gone are the days of come to my website, you know, let's say it's a contest, come to my website, fill this form and you're done, right? Or come to my website, read this information and you're done. It's really become about engagement, right? People in the early days of the internet, it was all about how much hits did I get to my website? How much traffic did I get? And don't get me wrong, that's still a KPI, but I want to know how long are you spending on our website? How much are you interacting with our brand? So here for Cialis, as an example, one of the things we noticed was, you know, the time on site was very low, right? Because how much were people reading about this? And we wanted to engage them more. At the time, you know, they were looking at arena sponsorships, which was very expensive. And I said, hey, I have an idea. What if we create a virtual arena? What if instead of going to the NHL and trying to sponsor all their arenas, we create a virtual arena and then to make people sort of engage with the brand more, we're going to create this interactive hockey game, right? Where it was all Cialis branded, the the boards were Cialis branded, the ice was Cialis branded. At the end of the game, a Zamboni drives along, that's Cialis branded. So the brand's perspective was this is great brand awareness. This is awesome. And to the consumer, we created this really fun hockey game. And if you're watching the video, you can sort of see some of it, but we created this really fun hockey game where there's a goalie in the net wearing a Cialis jersey and you had to flick to shoot to score on the net and it was timed and we had people competing with their friends for how many goals they could score. And suddenly this sort of short experience that was transactional of come to the website, read the information and leave now became this experience of I'm actually doing something. I'm interacting with the website. I'm playing this game. And that was a really powerful thing that drove such stronger engagement. And we've seen other brands do that. We, we've done it with Doritos. We've done it with Mountain Dew. We've done it with Purex. We've done it with all these brands, which is let's not make just an experience that takes five seconds. Let's make an experience that actually draws the consumer in, that engages them, that gives them some fun and an experience they want while reinforcing our brand messaging. This is awesome, Robert. I feel like you could sell this to the NHL, this video here. They should be using this in their in their promotions. So I will tell you, the last game we made, we got high praise. The last game we made for a client was with a partnership with the NHL. And my team was super excited because we actually got an email from the NHL saying, like, this was incredible. Um, and they told the agency partner, like, we love this work. This is amazing. We made a full 3D arena. Um, and I'm a big sports guy. So get, having an email that I could print out from the NHL saying this is awesome. I uh, was certainly exciting for uh, myself and the team, and we love celebrating those victories. This is pretty cool. I love it. Um, so it was actually an interactive game also. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what made it fun, right? Like, you need to add utility to consumers today, right? There's a lot of competition. Everyone lives on their phone. So if you're going to get people's attention and you want their attention for a longer time, you better add something of value. And that's not just gamification. That's in everything we do. Our data scientists are constantly studying the websites we're building, the emails we're sending, the media campaigns we're putting together to figure out how can we drive engagement? Because if I have a one second interaction with you, that's not very good. I need something longer because it takes one click to hit that back button. You could go anywhere. And meanwhile, I don't have you hitting the back button. I have you engaging with our brands. And that's really powerful. What's this one? Uh, we're looking at PepsiCo and National Gamified Contest. 
yeah, so that was a uh, um, that was almost like a little bit of a, a sort of a pick behind a lucky door, if you will. So instead of just saying, "Hey, here's what you won," it was, "Here's four bags of Lay's chips. Which bag do you want to open?" And then depending on which bag you opened, determine what you got. So it was exciting. You know, I was called the slot machine strategy. What are you going to get? Um, but it made it more exciting than just, you know, scratch here and you win or you lose. You kind of felt like you were in control. It was still kind of chance, but it also made it more sticky. So we had people coming back over and over again because tomorrow they wanted to open up a new bag to see what they got. Love it. My last question, first of all, thank you, Robert. Thank you for sharing your journey, um, your expertise and your stories. Um, my last question is throughout this business journey, I'd love to hear some of your mentors. And it could be your actual personal mentors that in business, agency life, and also any distant mentors, you know, books that you've you've loved throughout the years. Yeah. So hands down, easily, uh, I know the answer because it is my father. Uh, and I've said that for forever, forever, ever. Uh, he knows it. I know it. Uh, he was the biggest inspiration on me starting this. He's an entrepreneur. So I like to say it's infused in my DNA. Um, but I think beyond what did sort he do? of watching... Yeah, beyond watching him sort of do it and see what that was um, and seeing that work ethic, right? I mean, he's the hardest working guy I've ever seen. Uh, my goal in life is to not work as hard as he was, although I'm certainly a workaholic. Um, so that, that inspiring work ethic, but he was so encouraging. And no matter what I was doing, uh, when we were struggling, he was encouraging. When we were being successful, he was encouraging. And I think the biggest thing he taught me was everything was a learning opportunity. And that's a value I've taken from, from the very first day I started this company. Everything is a learning opportunity. And I will I tell my kids that to this day, where I would do something and I would fail. And he would say, as long as I learned something, it wasn't a failure. And I think because that resonated so much with me, and I have no shortage of mistakes I've made over the last two decades, and I was young when I started, and if I only knew what I knew now back then, but because I look at it as everything is a learning opportunity, and even, you know, we, we lose, we fail, but we didn't fail because we learned something. Because I say that for literally everything I do, I post game all my decisions, everything else, it sort of set me on this path of always trying to be better and always sort of seeing the positive. You know, maybe we just went poorly, but how could we be better next time? And that was just so inspiring. So easily, hands down, he was my biggest mentor, still my biggest mentor, still my biggest cheerleader. I'll throw my mom in there as well so she doesn't listen to this later and say, yo, where was my credit? Uh, also very inspiring. So mom, definitely shout out to you. Um, but definitely business-wise, uh, my father, definitely biggest mentor, hands down. What were his businesses? What what kind of business was he in? Uh, yeah, so he runs a television advertising company, uh, which has some irony to it. Because while I'm moving people from broadcast to YouTube, he is still selling uh, still selling TV. So not only did he inspire me, uh, but now our two industries collided a little bit and it's fun to watch. But still, there's no one who's a bigger cheerleader uh, today than, than him, without a doubt. Robert, I want to be the first one to thank you. Thanks. Ch everyone check out EliteDigitalAgency.com, more episodes of the podcast, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See, life's like a beach If you find the sand right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand